Hello and welcome to session three of our eight-week course on praying with the Gospel of John. And this week we're going to look at signs and wonders in John's Gospel. We began our study by looking at the structure of John's Gospel. I just want to quickly review that at the beginning here. The Gospel opens with a prologue in chapter 1, the first 18 verses in which the author reveals to us the true identity of Jesus and his mission in coming into the world. The second section is called the Book of Signs. It goes from chapter 1, verse 19, all through the end of chapter 12. And in this section, the Gospel writer has selected several signs, miracles, that Jesus has done that for him uh, help reveal the truth of who Jesus is. So we're going to be looking at those signs today. The third section of the Gospel begins with chapter 13 and continues through the end of chapter 20. It's called the Book of Glory because here Jesus, who has come from above and has taken on human form to be one of us, now begins his ascent back to the Father. And the Book of Glory describes the last week of his life, beginning with the Last Supper, and moving through his crucifixion and resurrection. And then finally, uh, there's an epilogue added. Chapter 21 is, a, is a additional stories of the resurrection, which is added to the, to the document sometimes later. So um, we have uh, <clears throat> in this gospel, the gospel writer has chosen a series of signs. And the other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, would normally call these miracles. But John doesn't use the word miracle. Instead, he chooses to use the word signs. Because for him, the important thing is not just that something miraculous happened, that something unexpected, supernatural, out of the ordinary happened. But the important thing for him is what these things indicate. They are signs that point to uh, Jesus' identity and Jesus' mission. And so these signs are meant to reveal. So the emphasis is away from the miraculous and toward what does this sign point to? What does it show us about Jesus? John states this uh, purpose in his gospel in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. He says, Therefore, many other signs... Uh, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John indicates to us here that he has carefully selected certain signs. He's not telling us about all the signs that Jesus did, but he's selecting certain signs uh, that he is presenting to us in the hope that we uh, will be led by these signs to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah or the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we may find life in his name. So let's uh, take a look at the seven signs in the book of signs. Uh, I've listed them here, uh, John chapter 2, the changing of water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. John chapter 4, beginning verse 46, the healing of an official son. John chapter 5, the hearing, healing of a paralytic at Bethesda. Uh, John chapter 6, the miraculous feeding of 5,000 people. John chapter 6 again, following the, the feeding story, is the story of Jesus walking on water on the Sea of Galilee. John chapter 9, which we talked about extensively in session 2, the healing of a man born blind. And finally, John chapter 11, where we hear the story of Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. So those are the seven signs that John has chosen, <clears throat> each of them uh, pointing to some aspect of who Jesus is and explaining why he's come. Remember, John is writing a gospel. His, his purpose is to, uh, is to inform us, but
but also to lead us to belief. So let's look at the first sign, and I'm, I'm going to go through the signs uh, rather quickly, but just pointing out some of the features of each sign that are particular to John's Gospel. And uh, uh, some of these stories are told in other Gospels as well, but John includes some details that are unique to him, so that's where we'll put our focus. I'd like to begin by sharing with you an icon of this story from John 2, changing the water into wine at the, at the wedding feast of Cana. I'll try to position this so you can see it as, as, as good as possible. And <clears throat> so we have Jesus here with his mother. His mother has also been invited to this wedding feast. It, it's likely that it was some, uh, some uh, couple that they, the family knew. Both Jesus and his mother are invited to attend and several of Jesus' uh, disciples accompany him to the feast. You see, the icon portrays uh, the people at the feast and uh, the servants and musicians. The bride and groom up here in the corner and then uh, the servants here and down in the lower right hand corner, significant detail are the, the large jars uh, uh, that contained water, which was used for purification rites in, uh, in, in Jewish culture. And it's these uh, jars of water that Jesus changes into wine. And uh, when the uh, wine for the feast has, has run out. And I'll try to um, include a picture of that icon so you can look at it in more detail in the handout that we send you following this, this um, teaching. So John's purpose in telling a story about Jesus at a wedding banquet is not to uh, show that Jesus sanctifies the institution of marriage, which might be the impression that you get if you attend a wedding ceremony and this, this story is referred to or quoted from. Now, he's not there to sanctify the institution of marriage. He's there rather uh, giving a sign that is pointing to what we call the messianic banquet. And this is, this is something that uh, 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 stretches back into the Old Testament prophecies where people anticipated the coming of the Messiah. And the imagery that was used often with the coming of the Messiah was the image of a, a banquet. Uh, the Messiah was to come and to uh, overthrow Israel's enemies at this time, that would have been uh, the Romans occupying and, uh, and uh, the religious leaders who oppressed the people. So the Messiah comes and takes, but he also comes uh, to uh, invite people to a grand festival or feast, uh, often portrayed as a wedding feast. So this imagery is used in the, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's further used. Jesus becomes the bridegroom and the church becomes the bride in this ceremony. The churches are also the people who are invited to attend. Uh, so this uh, imagery of wedding banquet uh, is quite familiar, both in the Old and New Testaments. What's particular in John's Gospel here is uh, his suggesting as well that Jesus coming, the coming of the Messiah, now changes uh, Jewish rituals and regulations and things. All of these things are seen in a new light. And that, uh, that comes out particularly in this detail about these large stone jars which contain water for the rites of purification. Jesus is, uh, is moving that aside, changing the water into wine. So now these uh, stone jars, which had a particular liturgical and uh, religious purpose, now are filled uh, to overflowing with, with wine. It's a tremendous amount of wine and the abundance, the, the sheer amount of wine that is created here is meant to be a sign of the abundance of God in the Messianic banquet. 
and uh, the wine, in fact, is better than the wine that it replaces, the original wine that ran out uh, in the feast. And uh, Jesus uh, performs the miracle to rescue the wedding party, as it were. John also uh, indicates by this sign that uh, the disciples were led to believe in him. This is the first sign that he gives of the seven. And he says that this is, uh, uh, this is an indication, this, this sign is pointing to the fact um, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he has come to establish God's reign. The glory of God is present in Jesus, abides in Jesus, and uh, Jesus manifests this glory through the signs and wonders that he does. The Word became flesh, John said in the prologue, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. That word glory belongs also to the Old Testament. When the Israelites were moving through the wilderness, God's presence accompanied them in a cloud of uh, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, was among the people and rested over the tabernacle and then later over the temple in Jerusalem itself. But now Jesus has come, and Jesus is the one who is, uh, is showing forth the glory of God. So because of his coming, the rituals and uh, uh, practices and regulations of Judaism begin to fall away. They're no longer necessary. A new vision has come. There's one particular detail that I want you to note in this story uh, that before we move on, and that is the conversation between Jesus' mother and Jesus. Jesus' mother is the one who draws his attention to the fact that the, run, the wine has run out and the Hosts are in a bit of a difficult situation. Jesus responds to her by asking, what is that to you and me? He says, my hour has not yet come. Now, this is a phrase that occurs again and again in the Gospel of John. My hour, the hour is not yet come. And all through the book of signs, we have several repetitions of this line, my hour has not yet come. The hour comes at the transition from the book of signs to the book of glory. In other words, at the moment of the Last Supper, which is the, marks the beginning of the book of glory of Jesus' ascent uh, in the last seven chapters there of John's uh, gospel chapters 13 through 20 at least. So in, the, in those chapters we read at the beginning, uh, chapter 13 verse 1, we read, Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world and go to the Father. And so we see him taking up the servant's towel and uh, basin and washing the feet of his disciples. The hour has come for him to depart from this world and go to the Father. So that, that great arc that we were talking about, that great cycle of movement from above to earth and then to return to the Father um, uh, begins its upward ascent now in chapter 13, the beginning of the uh, uh, the book of glory, and Jesus says, now my hour is here, now my hour has come, where he begins his return to the Father. The second sign we see in the gospel is in John chapter 4, it follows the story of the Samaritan woman. So Jesus has been in Samaria, and now he's returning to Galilee. And uh, as he returns and re-enters Galilee, he enters this same village of Cana, and he meets there a royal official. Uh, we don't know exactly what a royal official was, but probably some sort of person who worked in the government uh, under King Herod Antipas. 
Herod Antipas was the tetrarch, the ruler of the northern part of uh, Israel, uh, the region of Galilee, uh, during the lifetime of Jesus. He was the son of Herod the Great. And um, uh, Jesus once referred to him in the Gospel of Luke as that fox. He didn't have a very positive uh, reputation and was a shady character. But he's the, he's the ruler of this area. So probably this man was a bureaucrat in his administration. The official meets Jesus and asks him to heal his son, who is very ill with a fever and uh, is near the point of death. The son is not there in Cana, interestingly enough. The, the son is in Capernaum in the man's home, which is about 20 miles from Cana. And Cana is in the hill country of in Galilee. And so this would be down uh, in the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is several hundred feet below sea level. And Capernaum is a city right on the northern coast of the, of the Lake of Galilee. And so uh, he uh, meets Jesus and he begs him to heal his son. And Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus has a word of, of warning uh, in chapter 4, verse 48, um, he responds with a word of warning about just believing in signs only. But he then fulfills the man's request, and the man begins to head for home. He's met by his servants coming from the other direction, who tell him that the boy has been healed. And uh, the, uh, the official realizes that he was healed at the very same time that he was talking with Jesus. And so we read that this man believed along with his household. So once again, the sign leads to belief in Jesus. But let's look back at this John chapter 4, verse 48. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Uh, Jesus is commenting on a faith that is based only on signs. So we have this kind of uh, a tension between John is offering us signs and hoping that they will lead us to belief. But Jesus is saying uh, it's easy to get caught up in the signs and to, uh, to see only the signs and to be uh, captivated only by the signs. John wants us to move beyond the, beyond the miracles themselves to see the truth of, of what they're pointing to. And so he says, don't get caught up in just the deeds of power themselves, but see them as divine deeds of revelation. Uh, recognize what they're pointing to, what their significance is. So this, uh, this tension comes up again in the gospel. We'll see it later in chapter six in the uh, discourse following the um, feeding of the 5,000. We'll pick up this same signs again, but here's a first note of skepticism on the part of Jesus. Um, uh, unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. The gospel goes on in, and you'll remember, and the second encounter of Jesus with his disciples after he's risen from the dead, when Thomas is present. And Thomas wants to see and touch Jesus. He needs that sign in order to come to belief. But Jesus says, uh, blessed are those who have believed but have not had uh, uh, been able to witness a sign. So uh, uh, the third uh, sign that we see in Gospel of John is in chapter 5, the healing of a paralytic at Bethesda. Now Bethesda was a pool that had healing qualities. It's just inside the gate, uh, the, the sheep gate, on the eastern side of uh, Jerusalem. But just inside the gate, there are these pools. Uh, you can see the ruins of them there today. And this pool had five porticos, and it was a gathering place for people who were invalids and had various kinds of uh, um, sicknesses or disabilities. Jesus meets there a man who has been there for 38 years. And Jesus asks him, uh, 
why he hasn't been healed yet. And he's, he gives an excuse that he's never been able to get to the water in time. Apparently the tradition has it, or the understanding of the people was that occasionally the water was stirred by the angels. And if one entered the water at that moment or soon after, uh, he would receive a healing. This man, he's paralyzed and he claims that because he can't get to the water in time, he always misses out on these special moments. Um, Jesus looks at him and asks a very interesting question. He says, do you want to be healed? And it's a question that gives us pause because we recognize sometimes in, in our own human experience, sometimes we will hold on to something, uh, some uh, sickness or some character quality or uh, something. Uh, we find a kind of comfortable identity there. It's become part of who we are and we're not looking uh, for, for change. And it may be that Jesus perceived in this man that he had become comfortable at, uh, begging for alms at the pool and just lying beside the pool each day and he had given up the expectation or the hope of actually being healed. So Jesus touches on his desire, do you want to be healed? And that's a question that he might ask us too. Is there something that you're holding on to. Maybe you say, well, I'm just an angry person. That's just my temperament. That's my personality. And Jesus might say to us, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be changed? Do you want to become someone new? The significance of the story comes in verse 9 of chapter 5, where it says, now the day was a Sabbath. And of course, we know what this means. Uh, this will uh, upset the Pharisees and the religious leaders. The man is uh, uh, healed by Jesus and told to take up his mat and walk. But as he does this, he's stopped by the Pharisees who challenge him because he is not allowed to carry a mat on the Sabbath day, which is a day of rest. And so they they uh, correct him and uh, point out his error and uh, ask him uh, how he's come to do this. And so he tells them that he's been healed by Jesus. And, uh, uh, and yet uh, they're obsessed uh, with this question of Sabbath observance. It's a kind of ironic contrast because uh, here this tremendous miracle has happened. This man has been 38 years paralyzed and laying by this pool, hoping for a, a, a miraculous healing. Now receives this miraculous healing. His life has completely changed and transformed. He can return to his family and to, to work and to uh, uh, all kinds of things that were not possible to him before. And the glory of this amazing miracle uh, is shifted immediately. Uh, uh, the attention is shifted away from the glory of the miracle immediately by the Pharisees who only want to talk about this breach of their law. And uh, here, we, here we see another strong sign of the opposition to Jesus. Uh, Jesus' opponents uh, revealing some of their hostility. In uh, chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, we see these uh, opponents summarizing some of their critique of Jesus. It's not so much the miracle itself that uh, has upset them, but it's the fact that Jesus routinely does such things on the Sabbath day. And then the second charge uh, brought against Jesus, not only a violation of the Sabbath, is, uh, is the charge of blasphemy. Uh, Jesus defends himself when they criticize him by saying, the Father is working and I need to be working too. And they take this, uh, 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 this to mean that he is identifying himself with God. And uh, this uh, um, is dangerous uh, in their view. His claim, if his claim is true, he's making uh, an astounding and breathtaking claim, uh, claiming, in fact, to be equal to God. For the Jews, this was blasphemy. 
And we see this theme will continue through the gospel. In fact, John interprets the persecution and the eventual death of Jesus as resulting from Jesus' divine claims about himself. So blasphemy is the thing that in John's gospel uh, leads to Jesus being crucified. In fact, John is uh, saying Jesus is not just being persecuted here, Jesus is on trial here. In fact, they're constantly looking for things to accuse him of. And uh, we'll notice in, uh, as this moves on into chapter 5, the, next, the, the rest of chapter 5 is filled with imagery uh, about uh, um, a testimony and about witnesses, about judgment. Um, it uses a lot of language uh, related to trials. And uh, why is the evangelist then weaving this language about uh, trials and witnesses and judgments and things uh, uh, into this story? Uh, and it's because he sees Jesus here as being on trial uh, by his opponents being forced to defend himself. And, uh, and uh, this is undoubtedly related to the experience of the religious community from which this gospel comes, because at the end of the first century, they're experiencing similar persecutions and uh, similar uh, opposition, uh, questioning, uh, probing, uh, accusations uh, from their own uh, neighbors and fellow countrymen. Now, uh, here again, we want to be careful to mention that uh, Jesus' term, the Jews, has a very particular meaning in this gospel. It refers to a small subset of Jews who were the leading opponents of Jesus, mostly those in leadership positions in the Jewish religious structures. So, uh, unfortunately and tragically and horribly, uh, this gospel has sometimes been used by Christians as a justification for persecution of the Jews. And uh, of course, this is not uh, the author's intent or our intent in preaching this gospel. Uh, being Jewish is not the problem here. And Jesus was Jewish, as were his disciples. And uh, it is these opponents of uh, of Jesus, this a small band of uh, Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and others, who are uh, in opposition to Jesus, uh, who the Gospel writer calls the Jews. And because this persecution continues in, through the first century and is part of the experience of the Johannine community, uh, there is this tension between the Jews who have accepted Jesus as Messiah and those who have not accepted him as the Messiah, that tension grows and seems to worsen over time. And so this gospel reflects some of that tension in the way that John talks about the Jews. But he is not meaning all of Jews, all the Jews, or he's not meaning uh, uh, Judaism itself. It's simply referring here to Jesus' opponents. There's one other thing to note in this uh, fifth chapter of John's Gospel. We see that Jesus, in doing these signs and wonders, is intimately linked with the one that he calls Father. He goes so far to say, as the words that I say are not my words, they're the words that the Father gives me. And the things you see me doing are the things that the Father is doing. In John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. And in verse 30 of the same chapter, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
the picture of Jesus in John's Gospel is that he abides in the Father. He's living in intimate connection and communion with the Father every day, every moment. And so the words that he's saying, the, the miracles that he does, the signs, all flow from this intimate connection that he has with the Father's. He's come not to do his own will, but to do the will of the one who sent him. The fourth sign is the story of the feeding of 5,000 people. Now this is a familiar story and all of the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, have uh, 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 tell it. And, uh, but there are a couple of things in John's telling of this story that are distinctive. The first is that John makes specific the relation of this story to the Old Testament story of the people being fed during their wanderings in the wilderness uh, through the intercession of Moses with manna, or bread from heaven, they called it. And so Moses uh, gave the people bread from heaven. God furnished bread to uh, support them and to help them survive on their travels through the wilderness. It was called manna. John's story here has exact parallels with the story of the giving of the manna in Numbers chapter 14. There are similar uh, similarities between these two stories. So John is drawing a direct comparison between these two stories, and he's suggesting that Jesus supersedes Moses, uh, almost replaces Moses. Moses was able to provide bread from heaven, uh, by uh, pleading for God uh, to sustain the people by giving them food. Jesus not only gives them bread from heaven, but he himself is the bread of heaven. He claims himself to be the food that God is offering for their sustenance. He calls himself the bread of life. Now Jesus, uh, in this story, another feature that's unique to John's account of it is that Jesus is not only providing food, but he's also testing the developing faith of his disciples, and in this case, particular Philip. We see uh, a kind of, in, in several of these stories in John's Gospel, as we had in The Man Born Blind, we see a kind of progression to faith. Uh, seeing these various signs, people gradually come to faith. And we see him testing uh, Philip's faith here uh, by asking him, uh, and Jesus asks Philip, what should we do? We've got all these people to feed. And uh, Philip's response uh, indicates that he's not yet uh, convinced about Jesus' uh, ability to perform a miracle here. He complains that eight months' wages, common laborers' wages for eight months, would not be enough to feed the crowd. And so he, he doesn't uh, imagine that Jesus uh, will be able to solve this problem. So his faith is not quite there. And another aspect of this story that's unique to John is uh, is speaking, as, as we just mentioned a little bit before, about the suspicious motives of the crowd. Uh, the, the crowd is being caught up in the signs, but they're not coming to believe what these signs point to. And so that's, uh, that becomes an issue. In John chapter 6, the second verse, we read, A great crowd of people followed him. But then the author says, Because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. So this crowd gathers. These people are coming together. They're looking for Jesus. They're following Jesus. They're coming as a, as a multitude of people. But they're coming because they've seen signs of uh, Jesus healing others. And so the signs attract them. Uh, and in verse uh, 14 and 15 of John chapter 6, we read, after people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, namely the feeding of the 5,000, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew to a mountain by himself. 
So in, in John's Gospel, the crowd wants to force Jesus to define his mission and work politically, to become a king who would rival uh, King Herod and uh, the Romans. And Jesus wants no part of such a kingship. He has not come to be a king of the kingdoms of this world. Uh, after the telling of the story of the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, the first 15 verses, there follows a second um, miracle, and that is Jesus walking on water. We're going to skip over that just for the time being to pick up again on John chapter 6, verse 25, because there's a lengthy discourse that follows here uh, in which uh, John is offering us some understanding a uh, further understanding of the importance of this uh, miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So this lengthy discourse actually has three sections. And in these sections, uh, Jesus uh, gradually gets more and more controversial. At first, he uh, talks about this bread that has come down from heaven, and he relates it to the manna that was given to the people of Israel in the wilderness. Then he goes on to identify this bread with himself, saying, I am the bread of life. And uh, this is a little bit more confusing for some people, and they don't know how to grasp this. And then he pushes the envelope even further when he says, this bread is my flesh. The Greek word is sarx, S-A-R-X. And we see this word in the prologue, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But here, when Jesus says, this bread is my flesh, and he says to them, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, this is too much. And it, uh, most of the people cannot grasp what he's talking about. These words are offensive to Jews. Uh, the eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood. Of course, uh, John here is using imagery that we're very familiar with in the Eucharist. And John's community, by the end of the first century, was regularly practicing the Eucharist. And so uh, these words are not that mysterious to the, the readers of John's Gospel, but they were mysterious to these first hearers. And we read that more and more of them started leaving and going away uh, from Jesus. Uh, because his words were increasingly offensive. Finally, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, will you also leave? And uh, Peter has this wonderful confession, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of life. But here again, we see this theme that has been right from the beginning, right from the prologue on, that Jesus comes into the world and his message is received by some, but rejected by others. And here we see a good portion of the crowd turning away and not being able to accept his message. The fifth sign then, if we back up to uh, John chapter six, verses 16 to 24, is Jesus walking on the water and the Sea of Galilee. The disciples have put out in a boat, they're encountering rough seas, uh, geographically, that's an area where uh, strong winds uh, come up quickly, and so it's a dangerous area for boating, and they are caught in a storm and not making any progress in rowing against the storm. And then they see Jesus coming on the water toward the boat. And uh, this frightens them. Uh, they're terrified uh, by this vision of Jesus. This is a, a miracle on water, which also has Old Testament origins. Uh, remember that uh, Moses led the people of Israel through the water of the Red Sea uh, to enter into their wilderness period. So there was a great uh, uh, crossing of the Red Sea and the defeat of Pharaoh's army uh, was a turning point in uh, Jewish history. And here we have another uh, water miracle. One of the things that's significant about this water miracle is that when Jesus gets to the boat and the disciples see him, they're terrified. They think they're seeing a ghost. But Jesus says, it is I. And 
the Greek words that are used here uh, is a very uh, frequently used expression in John's Gospel, uh, which means I am. The, in Greek, it's ego I may, E G O, and then E I M I, ego I may, I am. So Jesus is just saying, it is me. And now he might be using this just to identify himself, saying it's me. You know, it's not a ghost, it's me. You, you know who I am. But, um, but here, the, the ego I me is the same phrase that's used uh, by God when he reveals his identity to Moses. Uh, when Moses asks him for a name, uh, uh, God uh, responds, I am, that I am. And so this uh, term, I am, comes into play here for the first time. And this uh, term will be used again and again uh, through the gospel, where Jesus uses ego I may, for I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, I am the vine. These are all ego I may sayings. So here it's used just by itself, without an, without an object, and uh, it, it is a form of his self-identification. But uh, Jesus here uh, crossing the water, hearkening back to Moses leading the people through the water on their journey out of Egypt. Uh, but Jesus is also fulfilling the role of God in these signs. He is feeding and protecting and rescuing and guiding his uh, people despite the calamities and the threats that surround uh, we, The sixth sign is the, the healing of the man born blind. We spent quite a bit of time on this in our last session, so we'll pass over it now to get to the final sign, the seventh sign, which is the greatest of the signs, uh, the most spectacular, but also the most meaningful, and the one with the greatest consequences. This is in John chapter 11 where Jesus hears of the sickness of his friend Lazarus in Bethany, and he delays his journey there uh, for a couple of days, and then uh, finds that uh, Lazarus has died. This is a wonderful story because we see John holding this tension between Jesus' divinity and Jesus' humanity. In terms of Jesus' humanity, we see a very vulnerable Jesus in this in this story, he's, he's actually shaken by the news that Lazarus has died. And John records that Jesus wept uh, when he got there and got to the tomb where Lazarus was buried. He wept. He was genuinely moved, genuinely broken by this, seeming very vulnerable, very human here. We see a very tender Jesus who is, who is uh, affected by grief. But it's also clear that his divinity is at work here in terms of his, the miracle that he performs. It's clear that Jesus loves these friends, Lazarus with his sisters Mary and Martha. He says, uh, they come to him and say, the Lord, Lord, the one you love is sick. And then later it tells us in verse five, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. In verse 11, it refers to our friend Lazarus. And then in verse 36, the people say, see how he loved him. And so it's, uh, this affection that Jesus has for this small family is, uh, is very evident throughout the story. This is the last of the signs in the book of signs, and it is a sign that sets in motion the series of events that will lead to Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. So in the final verses, John 11, verse 53, we read, So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. So by this point, Jesus' reputation is growing, his following is growing. This is becoming increasingly problematic for the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. And so this uh, spectacular miracle, which will again lift him up in the estimation of the people, they see is just too threatening. And, and so from that day, they plan to put him to death. 
We don't know exactly why the Pharisees found it so difficult to, uh, to believe in Jesus or to trust Jesus. It may have been they were afraid of an uprising or uh, that would happen among the people if the people tried to make uh, Jesus a king. And uh, that uprising could have been squelched by the Roman army, which was numerous and extremely powerful, and the people wouldn't have had much chance. Maybe they were af afraid of that kind of uprising of support of Jesus and the possibility of a Roman retaliation which might uh, destroy the city and uh, possibly destroy the temple, which we see, in fact, happened uh, 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 in, in the year 70. The temple was destroyed some 40 years after Jesus um, uh, was here and doing these signs. It may be that their resistance comes from a fear of change, that they are settled in their beliefs and comfortable with their position of power, their status in the community, and they're afraid of what changes Jesus might bring about. And they might be afraid of losing their control, their power, their influence uh, to Jesus' popularity. Or perhaps they're just jealous of Jesus. He's drawing large crowds and great interest, and people are are saying he is a man of God, and uh, they may find this to be very threatening personally. So it's probably a mixture of all of those things, and we can recognize that same uh, conflict going on in our own hearts. Uh, most of us that are participating in this program have undoubtedly believed in Jesus and accepted Jesus' teaching and his testimony. But there's always part of us, isn't there, that struggles with doubt or that struggles with resistance. Sometimes we too are afraid of what changes Jesus might ask of us or how it might influence our life to really fully embrace Jesus. There's also a symbolic uh, part of this story, the imagery of Jesus calling forth the dead man calling him out of the tomb and into the light of day and back to life of uh, Lazarus emerging from the tomb and Jesus saying to the people around, uh, unbind him and set him free. Those are rich uh, uh, metaphors and images for us to bring into our prayer. So this week uh, we'll send you a handout uh, following this talk and uh, you'll be able to pray this week with these seven signs. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the theme of laying down one's life, which is a prominent theme in John, and which will uh, signal the transition from the Book of Signs to the Book of Glory. Thank you again for joining us in this course, and God bless you this week.